All right. Well, super excited for this panel discussion. It's near and dear to my heart, obviously. Uh, this is workplace peace building, a new approach to culture enhancement. And we have with us today Alice Shakina. Alice mediates divorces, business separations, workplace conflict, landlord tenant issues, and family conflicts. She also sharpens entrepreneurs with negotiation and sales skills through her negotiation academy. Alice is tireless in her quest to help others. In her, in her free time, she teaches conflict transformation in the jails to the incarcerated. She's currently the chair of the conference committee for the, for the Academy of Professional Family Mediators and is planning the annual 20, two, 2022 um, APFM, Academy of Professional Family Mediators Conference. And you can learn more about her at shakinamediation.com. Welcome, Alice. Our next panelist is Terrell Holmes. Uh, Terrell is the founder of The Good Org, a workplace peace building consultancy. And as an organizational consultant, uh, Terrell has shared his expertise with several institutions and individuals across multiple industries. Among those are Kaiser Permanente, eBay, California Department of Corrections, and St. Mary's College of California. He has provided organizational assessment, facilitation, coaching, training, and change, man change management consulting services for those organizations and others. Terrell has worked with many marketing technology companies, providing interactive analysis, account management, and directing professional services for industry-leading organizations. You can learn more about him and his work at thegoodorg.com. Good to have you, Carell. And Henry Impolsky is a recognized leader in the field of conflict transformation. He's worked with hundreds of complex conflicts around the world and is also an experienced educator, coach, author, and TEDx speaker. With extensive experience, both as a labor and employment, labor and employment lawyer and as a peace builder, Henry has worked across multiple industries, including higher education, faith-based organizations, international organizations, law enforcement agencies, law, large and small not-for-profit private enterprises, um, he's he's recently written a book, which I'm sure he can mention and refer to. Uh, you can learn more about him at livingpeaceinstitute.com. And now I will hand it over to uh, the moderator for today who can introduce himself, Luke, and take it away. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, yeah, I'm so excited to to have this conversation with uh, the three of you. You've, the each all three of you come to this topic uh, from a very from a very different varying perspective. So I'm very excited to um, to hear what you all have to contribute uh, to this topic of kind of workplace culture, um, peace building, um, especially from a leadership perspective. And there's a number of different lenses we can uh, we can analyze this from. Um, so I, I'd love to kind of get us started and give each of you a chance to kind of, uh, you know, share your thoughts on kind of grounding us in what exactly are we talking about when we say workplace culture and and why it's important for leaders to be thinking about workplace culture. Um, I'm hoping we can keep it a dialogue, kind of keep it, uh, you know, kind of bounce ideas off of each other, but I'd love to start with just kind of giving you each a chance to kind of share um, a little bit about your initial thoughts on this. And then I'll just make a, a disclaimer to those in the, in the, uh, who are the attendees, feel free to type your own questions into the chat and I'll try to weave them into the conversation um, as well. Um, so opening question, give you each some time to, to kind of elaborate on this. Uh, what comes to mind when you think of workplace culture and why is it important for leaders to be thinking about it? And I'll let uh, uh, one of you uh, jump in. I'll go ahead and I'll start. Um, when I think of workplace culture, I think of how the, the workplace's values are, I'm going to say, put into action, how they show up in the workplace, um, whether they're consistent with the values or whether they're inconsistent with the value, the way they show up, whether they could be consistent with the values, inconsistent with the values, somewhere in between. But for me, it's about how the, va the values are lived on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and Terrell, could you um, share with us too, kind of the second part of the question of kind of why, speaking from a leadership perspective, mm -hmm. um, what, what, why might it be important for leaders who maybe are focus in maybe different aspects of the business, why is it important for, for leaders to have kind of their eye on, on kind of the leadership, uh, the culture development side of things? Um, because they not just have their eye on it, but to actually be it, um, in my opinion, that there's, they're leaders and they need to lead, not just in their, in finance or operations or whatever that might be. They actually need to know what the culture is and be able to lead it. I, not to sound like a zealot, but I like to think of culture as a bit like um, uh, 
the, uh, theocratic philosophy or theocracy. Henry, this is all you. Um, but when you're getting into the idea, of, we go to church, we go to church often, some of us who go to church, we go to church, we go to church on a regular basis, things are put into our heads over and over and over again. The pastor is a leader of that of that church or that flock. I see that as the same kind of idea. Not, not only is the leader supposed to live these values, but part of their job is to is to encourage everyone and remind everyone on a regular basis. This is what we do. This is how we do it. This is how we show up in the world. Great. I'm, I'm just going to I'm going to plant this seed because I'm going to probably want to come back to this of kind of what you're triggering for me, Terrell, is kind of the ivory tower uh, I, idea that a lot of leaders kind of get stuck in of kind of being way up here and not down and kind of seeing how the culture is being lived out um, and, and trying to kind of bridge that gap from what you're maybe trying to put out there, but then also kind of understanding what it's how that's lived on the ground. Um, thanks for thanks for kind of getting us started, Terrell. Alice, Henry, would either of you like to to go next and and elaborate on on your thoughts on this? Sure, I'm happy to jump in. Um, so thanks for having me. First of all, um, I think of workplace culture as sort of like it's the world that you live in pretty much most of the day, right? For people who are working 40 or more hours, it's your life, and so the people that you work with, it's your world, and so. As much as we can, we should strive as leaders to promote a healthy world to work in. Because as a mediator, especially in the workplace, I see a lot of toxic environments and I have to go in there and mediate these toxic environments. And it's very detrimental to people's health. We talk a lot about COVID and the mental health issues that came with COVID, but in a workplace, particularly where it's toxic, there's a lot of mental health issues being driven by the toxic nature of the people around you. And so as Terrell was also talking about, like, you know, how much, why do leaders need to think about this? You know, I worked in two different startups from the ground up. So they were just starting and I helped build them. And I watched from the inside out that culture comes down from the top. It is like driven from the top. So whatever the leader says, that is what all the policies that happen and what people like, you know, they're saying, this is what we have to do based on the leader. So the leader doesn't care. Then the policies don't get put into effect. And then the toxic nature happens because people are like, oh, it doesn't matter if we do this or do that. It doesn't matter if we misbehave because there are no consequences because the people at top don't really care, right? Or they only care about the bottom line. They don't care how we treat each other. So it doesn't matter if you're a leader and you say, I don't care, or you do care, either decision has massive consequences for your company and the company culture and the health of all of your, like, you know, your community. Yeah, I, I love, I love what you're saying there, Allison. I think we've all maybe worked in an organization where you can, you can tell whether the leader cares or not about the, the, the way their, the culture is being developed. Um, thanks for thanks for chiming in your thoughts, Alice. Um, Henry, do you want to kind of wrap us up on this opening question, and then we can kind of open up uh, more of a dialogue? Sure, sure. Well, uh, the analogy that comes up for me when I think of work culture is fragrance, right? It's fragrance that permeates the place, and if the fragrance is pleasant, right, then 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 everything just permeated by the pleasant fragrance. But if the fragrance is a stench, if it is not a pleasant fragrance, right? Again, it permeates every surface, every pore of that organization. And perhaps there comes a point where people within the organization, they may not feel the stench anymore just because they're so used to that. But to build on what Alice said, right? When we come in and we deal with that toxicity, you can immediately experience you know, the, 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 this stench, this rot that, that, that begins to happen. So why should leaders care? Why should leaders care? Leaders should care because I, culture, is, culture is absolutely essential to the organizational survival. If leaders are not interested in culture, they should get a bunch of machines, right? And maybe with machines, you don't have to worry about culture as well. You plug them in and, and, and you do maintenance and, and they're there. But if there is any sort of involvement with people, 
culture is what creates is is what helps us move when the culture is effective when the culture is inclusive then that's what helps us in my experience move even from teams to truly work communities to work communities that are inclusive to work communities that are excited to work communities that are inspired to work communities that are engaged and all of that all of that translates into work communities that are productive that are innovative and that do amazing work. I, I'm just, I'm very, I'm very struck. I'm still kind of putting my own thoughts around this, Henry, of kind of the fragrance analogy of putting myself into a situation where, okay, I'm in a room and it smells really good. Uh, like there's like lavender or something like that. And, I, and that, then I feel better. I'm more likely to treat other people, you know, better. But then I walk into, you know, a room and it's, and it's doesn't smell very good. You know, it's like, there's nothing else I can focus on. And, and so then it's all about my experience and I'm not concerned about other people's experience. And then that creates those more tense interpersonal relationships, but also your experience um, occupying that, that space. So that's a really interesting, I've never thought about it like that. That's a really interesting Way to way to think about it. Um, so let's let's have a conversation about this. And so I, I'd be curious to kind of know your all's thoughts about. Um, and maybe we could kind of start. You know, there's a lot of different lenses you could look at this from. You know, a leadership lens, from an intrapersonal or interpersonal systems uh, types of type of lens. But maybe we just start kind of building off of this idea of the leader and their involvement, and maybe getting a little bit more specific of of from what you've all seen with working with your clients and working within organizations to help develop and um, I, I say fix, you know, in quotes, but to kind of enhance culture, to, to promote, to increase that fragrance. Um, what are some, th what are, what's, what are some things that a leader should be thinking about and what should they be doing? Um, and I'm, and I'm thinking more just very general um, in terms of, of you're a leader, you have an organization, this is important for you. People who are, who are listening to this conversation might be, okay, I get it, it's important. But what, sh what should be some of these activities that leaders should be doing to promote culture enhancement? Hmm. So I can go first here, Luke. Um, so my background is in theater. And so I rely heavily on role play. So most of the things that I do, you know, fall within that realm. And from that lens, I really feel like, you know, talking the talk is one thing, but really giving your workplace community the tools and the strategies and the skills to be able to um, walk through their workday, uh, you know, deftly without stumbling, without offending people. I think that is a training that everyone absolutely needs. It is not enough to say, you know, let's hire diverse people and let's do this and let's be inclusive and all that. If you're not giving them the skills to be able to maneuver interpersonal relationships. And the main reason why these things happen is because people don't know how to do it. And then they're making mistakes and those mistakes either compound over time, causing people to get upset or quit or feel like, oh, this is not a healthy environment. And it's because People don't know. People don't know how to ask questions in um, a gentle manner or to approach people or to even understand, like, what do you need to do with yourself to educate yourself to be able to move around in different cultures, people who, who come from different backgrounds, people who come from maybe different countries, right? And so to be able to, as a leader, say, here are some trainings for you so that you know how to communicate. Communication is like this overbroad language, right? That we use and people think like, oh, well, we can communicate. I can talk. It's no big deal. But it is an art form. And in many ways, it is a lost art form. And so I think that leaders really need to look to giving their staff the skills that they need so that they do not walk around like a bull in a china shop causing harm to other people merely because they did not have the tools to be able to execute properly hmm. can i jump jump in uh, just to build on on something that alice had said you know in 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 working with a lot of organizations and, and leaders and now working in in academia I, i've observed kind of four distinct traits or principles. 
that can help transform an organizational culture from a leadership perspective. And these four start, first, first one is tuning inward. Is the leader willing to engage in some kind of introspective practice? And yes, this is here we talk about mindfulness. Now, the word mindfulness is so overused now and so commercialized, right? But here, when I talk about it, I don't talk about mindfulness in terms of feeling better. We do something to feel better. We meditate to feel better. I talk about mindfulness in terms of getting better at feeling so does the leader have that introspective practice that helps them to become more sensitive, meaning more in tune, more connected with where the people are, what is going on, what is happening? And can the organization create space, introspective space, where there is just sort of consistent reflection? Why are we here? What are we doing? Why, why is that important? The next aspect of it is creating a culture of observation versus evaluation. And this is where we talk about culture of listening. This is where tools like uh, peace circles, like restorative dialogues, right, which, which we do in corporate settings can come in where there is just a culture of listening, of listening. And so, so, so sometimes giving space to people to, to just share, share whatever it is that they need to share. I think the next, the next aspect for me that I saw is the culture of expansion. Now, expansion, not expansion at any cost. Sometimes expansion could, there are flip sides to that. But when I talk about expansion, meaning there is emphasis on healthy growth, there is emphasis on always seeing the big picture. What, what we're doing, how does this fit into kind of the greater sphere? What is our why? So again, I would connect it to that introspective space. And finally, exploration. And this is where leaders create space for curiosity, where there is curio culture of curiosity and even culture of play. I think this is critical. You know, the organizations that I've worked with where there is this element of play, that element of curiosity, that element of we're not just here, you know, to, to accomplish as many tasks as possible between the hours of nine to five or whatever they may be. We're also here to engage, to live, to have fun, to experience some joy. In my experience, those organizations and those leaders become transformative, uh, they grow, they attract talent, they keep talent. And something else from a leadership perspective, so many leaders come to their roles with a perspective of problem solving. Mm -hmm. And so they see everything as a problem. The people are the problem, you know, the deadlines, everything is a problem that needs a solution. But if we shift that from problem solving to empowerment, and start thinking about it, how could I empower these people, my managers, whoever I am working with, to be at their absolute best potential? And many great leaders will say, look, if it's with this organization, wonderful. If it's with another organization, even better, right? If someone comes in here and they grow and then they go somewhere else and then they can bring that level of expansiveness, wonderful. So moving from problem solving to empowerment. That's that's great. I, I love that kind of reframing. And then um, instead of looking for problems, you're looking for opportunities. Um, and you're and by doing so, you're solving problems in a way that maybe isn't so have so much of a stuffy scent. Um, going back to your fragrance uh, fragrance analogy, um, I want to kind of tie two of the th two things together that the two of you said. Um, uh, around kind of skill development and giving people skills um, with, uh, with, with Henry, with, with what you're saying of kind of the, the intrapersonal, but also listening um, aspect of things. And it feels so important um, to kind of wrap into that is the leadership engagement in it and then the action component. Because I, I know that I, I know working with organizations when a lot of people get a lot of organizations can be really good at listening, but not really good at follow-up. 
Um, and some organizations are really good at action, but not really good at listening and kind of balancing those two things. And then when you provide teams or organizations skills, they, they, you better be in those trainings too, um, learning the same skills that they are. So you're not just saying it's your problem because you can't, you don't have the skills to navigate the culture that I'm setting up, but I'm engaging it, in it with you. So I thought those were, that was an interesting kind of loop that the two of you kind of were creating, um, uh, creating with each other. Um, Terrell, you have any thoughts on 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 what Henry and, and Alice are saying? Or yeah, um, y'all really got me thinking about some some things, integrating some different ideas and, and some things that have come up for me way in the past I hadn't thought about. But uh, Alice, you were talking about how leaders, as I understood it, leaders need to teach how the how to be in the organization interpersonally. And Henry, you were talking about the idea of empowerment. And I see those more or less coming hand in hand, where if the leader is constantly living it and constantly showing it, and they say, okay, it's up to you, there's no, you don't have to think about what you're doing, you just make your decisions. That's when we talk about the American Express agent who's on the phone can make all sorts of big decisions because they know what the leaders would do and how the leaders would back them up. Um, one of the things I'm thinking about is the idea that, so Henry, going, all, going along with the fragrance idea, different things smell good to different people. Mm -hmm. um, the, I'm going to say the fragrance at a Wall Street trading house is very different from the fragrance you get at a, uh, a nonprofit that services uh, homeless youth. And what a lot of us who do this would think of as, we, we would look at a culture at a Wall Street trading house and go, oh my God, that's horrible, that's terrible culture. But if it matches their values and it helps them get their job done, then there's something to be said for a, a stench for one person being a rose for another mm -hmm. um, and ensuring that and this is very extended, excuse me, but, um, you know, I like notes of sandalwood. I like notes of rose. I like notes of evergreen. Bringing a person into your company and knowing that they are, those are already pleasant notes for them. It makes it a whole lot easier to get them on board, to empower them, to, to, to teach them the ways of your company and to to grab onto that fragrance. Um, I love a good a, a good metaphor, so thank you for that. That's that's I, I the, to me this, I think what you're saying, Terrell, or the way I'm interpreting it is is okay. There's the creating the culture part, and it's also bringing the people in that match the culture you're trying to create. Mm -hmm. um, and and recognizing when it's a good fit and when it's not a good fit, um, and to you know, bet not only for their benefit but for the organization and other uh, people's benefit. Is that is that kind of what you were what you're alluding to? Yeah, every every culture is not for everyone, and what some of us may think of as as a terrible culture may actually be good for that small niche. Is the point I think I'm trying to make, um, mm -hmm. e extending on on Henry's idea of the fragrance. So, so a lot of what we've talked about so far, it's, it's, it, there's a lot of like, I'm kind of separating this in my mind of like preventative or like development, I guess, culture development, and then like intervention, intervention and uh, culture correcting um, in, in, in some ways. Um, and I'm curious, uh, your all's thoughts on this more, okay, you're this new leader or we can even boil it down even more. We could go drop down a couple of levels and go, you're just like a mid-level manager who, who, who um, supports a team. And there's, you know, uh, needs to be some sort of uh, culture correction within that unit. Um, so you come into a culture that has um, a, a fragrance that it's not just your opinion that you don't like it, but other people are stating that, that it's a, it's a, it's a smell that they don't, they don't like the culture there is not um, is not serving that team or that organization well. If you're a new like tips for new leaders who are coming into that and haven't had the benefit, Alice, like what you were saying of like building it from scratch um, or having the tenure to really know the you know what's going on. You guys have any 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 tips or ideas on from from that perspective of of kind of culture correction from a new leader perspective. I have. Um, well, I want to just uh, comment a bit on what Terrell was saying, and I want to caution people about similarity bias. 
because I saw that happening inside of a company where everyone was so like, we need to make sure that everyone we bring in like fits in the culture and that we all get along. And they did such a good job of making sure everyone fit, that everyone was the same, right? There wasn't much diversity. There Mm -hmm. wasn't much diversity, even in like the academic backgrounds of people. They were all from Harvard and MIT, right? That was it. And, you know, mainly Caucasians, right? Very few Asians, very few African-Americans. And so you have to be careful when you are trying to, you know, say, oh, we want to make sure that you're a fit for our culture and we're building culture from the ground up that you don't fall into that similarity bias and end up having not much diversity because you like had your, so you want to like widen the lens. So as a, like a mid-level manager, you want to make sure that everyone understands how to relate, that if people are coming from different cultures, even amongst the United States, I'm not even talking about international, just the different cultures that exist here, that you want to make sure that you as a manager or a leader, you are doing your homework. You're learning like, how do I relate? What are the things that are important? What are things that are offensive to one person that may not be offensive to someone else? Like learn those things. It's not okay to say to everyone, you're coming into a dominant culture, adjust. That should not be the way it should be today, right? We're evolving and realizing that there are many more nuances that exist in the workplace in order for it to function in a healthy manner, managers and leaders need to acknowledge that there are different temperaments, there are different um, ways of being and people coming from different cultures have different values and to be able to balance that. And that is that is very tricky. And I think educating yourself on how different people, and you know what that means? It might not mean reading a book. It might mean going to different like networking groups where you expose yourself, making new acquaintances and friends in different areas that you don't have, right? Get out of your comfort zone. Mm. I'd like to build on that because uh, Alice, what what Alice said really resonates with me, you know, and and, and I think the, the bias where we can, everyone, we would try to make everyone fit into the culture. It, the danger of that bias is is very, very real. So my invitation to this new manager who's coming in is to focus on what they don't know. Focus on what they don't know. You know, in, in our culture here in the West, we have such an emphasis on knowledge. So many of us define ourselves based on our knowledge, right? We tend to create all these hierarchies based on letters someone has after their name or all all of these types of things. But our knowledge is always going to be limited. Our ignorance is limitless. It's boundless and limitless. And so as a new manager, if we can focus on, well, what is it that I don't know? What is it that I don't know? And if we start asking that question and engaging that question, the natural curiosity arises, right? Tell me more, tell me more, how can I learn? Another another thing that I would like to invite folks to consider here is this. We all know the golden rule, right? Treat others the way you would like to be treated. And I would like to modify that a little bit to say, to suggest treat others the way they would like to be treated. And that of course means, right? Again, we don't know. So we have to engage with them. We have to say, how do you prefer that I refer to you? What would it mean for you to have this space? What would it take for you to be your best self at work, right? Engaging with these questions and um, asking as many questions as possible again. The emphasis so often in corporate world on having the answers, but I think sometimes it's so much more critical to ask the right questions, to ask the right questions, and sometimes not know the answers, and sometimes be open, you know, to that uncomfortable space where we all don't know the answer, and we all have to sit with that discomfort. I want to um, add on to what y'all are saying. I'm, I'm thinking. <sighs> If I were a brand new manager and, and maybe giving a, a, a very 
I'm an OD guy who came from marketing. So I like, I like things to kind of, um, I like very clear instructions sometimes. And for me, if someone were asking me, I, I'd say first, do what Henry just said, sit down and start talking to people and ask that question. What is the culture like? How would you define it? Here are some words. Let's just, let's just see what you think, that kind of idea and get a, an overview that way. And then I would go to management separately and say, so what kind of culture are you trying to build? Mm -hmm. And then you can take a third step. If you wanted to, you could do like a Cameron and Quinn type type analysis, but where you really are showing management, this is what you want. This is where people are. There's a mismatch here. Um, and then there's a third part of that where we're getting into say the 360 and listening to people as they leave, which ideally should be done by a third party who is completely unbiased. Um, but you put all those things together and you get a picture of people are turning over because of these aspects of culture. Uh, these aspects of culture do or don't match. If they do match what the goal is and people are turning over because of it, then maybe we need to question what our values are in our culture. So um, that's that's the tack I would take if, um, if someone came to me and just said, as a middle manager, here's my situation, what should I do? And I want to tie that back to Terrell, how you defined culture at the beginning of of uh, the practices and the behaviors of so kind of like what Henry's talking about of kind of asking questions and having those conversations. Um, so when people say, well, people are manipulative or, you know, people are, you know, blaming or there's gossiping, you know, trying to ask even further, you know, what does that look like in practice? Like what are the behaviors and what are, what are the things being said? What, and then looking at maybe the practices and policies and procedures that might be supporting, um, you know, those, uh, those things, as well as the skills and communication skills and conflict resolution skills, as Alice was talking about, um, just kind of weaving that back in, Terrell, because that I think is a really important aspect of it. Is of, of I think we tend to label the culture in abstract words um, to the practicality of what's actually occurring that's creating those labels. Um, I, I don't I don't know if that if that kind of pings anything for uh, for the three of you, or if you if if that's something that re resonates. Um, we have a, a chat from Ashley, and I think that the I think her question, and Ashley, if if um, if I if I misphrase this, please correct uh, correct us. But kind of taking that lens of from a leader or a kind of a mid manager supervisor perspective, going down to like maybe someone who has less less power or authority or autonomy in the organization to make culture changes, maybe like an individual contributor or someone who's maybe in a really big organization and just kind of has this, you know, oversees a very small portion of it and notices or is feeling the culture um, in a particular way that um, as kind of extending the analogy, but um, actually wrote stinky behavior, um, but there isn't re receptivity for feedback above you or around you. Um, any thoughts or recommendations for somebody who's in that situation, in a culture where you are seeing these things, but you have very little influence and there isn't receptivity um, to listen, like what Henry was saying? I've come across people like that. I've coached them and they're in places where they're like, I can't give feedback to anyone above me if I'm unhappy because they don't care and they don't want to hear it. And so that is an issue. Um, and the only thing, you know, when I, as a negotiator, the only thing I can think of is like, what kind of leverage would they have as an individual contributor if they are not even close to being at the top, right? And the only thing that comes to mind is really strength in numbers. And if you can get enough people on board with you to say, yeah, this is something that's really not working for, the, for many of us to be able to approach leadership to say, hey, we'd like to have a conversation as a group. You don't get much power if you go by yourself. If you're somewhere down below, you're not even at middle management and you're an individual contributor, if people at the top just don't wanna hear your voice. But if they hear more people, I mean, that's sort of like the idea of unions, right? But sort of on a smaller scale, um, I think that if you can get enough people who care deeply about what is not going right, and then to frame the conversation so that it's a win-win. It's not coming, me coming, or the three of us coming to Luke and say, Luke, this isn't working, but to say, Luke, we actually have the same goals in mind for the company here and, and lay it all out. Explain, isn't this what you want? 
And in order to achieve it, we need to like slightly shift the company culture because we are not moving towards our mutual goals. So you really have to be careful how you frame that because you are going to walk in with a power imbalance in that conversation. Yeah. And I, I would want to add, uh, Ashley clarified of it is still kind of being a middle manager and your team's coming to you saying, hey, there's something off here, but there's no re receptivity above you to make changes. So you're kind of stuck in the middle of hearing what's wrong and, and then having um, no buy-in or, or emphasis um, above you. And, and that's it's bringing me back. I don't know how many people um, here saw Paul Falcone's talk earlier, um, but kind of the the idea of kind of presenting things of of in giving you know giving feedback and being able to say hey you know it's my my I feel like my role here is to help you above me understand what the experiences the experiences are of the people in your organization. I want to try to partner with you and give you that information and try to figure out how to move forward. Treat it as a win win, like what you were saying, Alice. Try to create partnership. Um, and and try to try to try to encourage some buy-in and some action uh, from from folks around you. That was just something that was on my mind from Paul's talk. Um, but Henry Terrell, anything um, anything kind of pinging for you on this topic? I want to endorse what Alice said. Just full, just full third endorsement on that because um, yeah, sometimes it, it, if you as a person were to make as an individual were to make waves, yet we know that companies hire and promote people who are most like them. That's just the bias we have, like you said, Alice. Right. If you're out there beating your drum and your drum is nothing like what leaders want, you really could be hurting yourself going at it alone. So I, I really, Alice, like you said, I think um, strength in numbers is a is a is a big thing. Um, if you are now, Luke, if you are a middle manager and you have some people underneath you, one of the things you can do is you can you have some. If you don't have, if you're not, if you're willing to try without asking permission. Um, maybe trying to build your own little, I'm going to say climate, not necessarily a culture, but your own little climate. Show that it works. You know, run a, run a pilot program, if you will. And then once you've seen that it works and, or you've made or you've optimized, then you build your case and take it up to the next level. Um, that, yeah. Yeah. So I would just add, I, I, I totally agree with Alice and Terrell, but I would also just add that sometimes we assume there is nothing we can do. Because sometimes that's the easiest assumption, right? If there is not, well, it's not up to me, it's up to them. I, I am just a little, you know, a, 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 a little part of this machine and, and, and there is nothing I can do. But, all, but, but what if regardless of where we are, regardless of what the title is, we could just lead without a title. So for someone who is a middle manager, maybe they cannot do, they cannot get to the CEO. They cannot change the culture of the entire company. But certainly they can do something to create the best possible culture, the best possible fragrance in their own little team, in their own cubicle, maybe even starting there, right? Just starting with themselves, starting with their team, being the best possible leader they can be. And as they are, as they are, naturally their influence is going to start growing. Naturally, their influence is going to start growing. Naturally, right? As they become more developed leader themselves, as others start seeing, wow, this person is really leading. This person is really leading by, by example. It doesn't matter what their title is. It doesn't matter if they're middle manager naturally, right? It's very natural for us. We start flocking to leaders. We start naturally forming coalitions with them. And as these coalitions form, right, then coming back to Alice's point, right, there's strength in numbers. Then we can talk, you know, talk to higher management, talk, take the win-win approaches, talk to higher management about why should they care? Why should they care, right? I am on the floor, I am the middle manager, I am seeing this is happening. Guess what, you better pay attention to this now or you're gonna be paying for this later, right? Um, but I think starting with, okay, my, if my sphere of influence is very small, still within a very small sphere of influence, what is it that I can do? What is it that I can do? You know, in, in sales, um, there is a there is an interesting rule that that I came across, and I think it's it, this is this is a, a useful rule to apply. 
And that is, don't tell me what you can't do. Tell me what you can do. Always tell me what you can do, right? And I think this is a shift in terms of how we can focus on our roles in mid-management or maybe even roles where we have no management responsibilities and we really feel stuck. But even in that role, without a title, what can we do? How can we lead? How can we contribute to better culture? And I, like, also, oh, I wanted to put a plug in for Terrell's idea of pilot, piloting something. I've done that. It's very effective. It's kind of like the, the huge TV networks. They only want to put in money for things that they know work, right? It's very similar. So within a company, they really are nervous at the top. So if you can prove that it works, you get better buy-in. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and most likely, if you're in a situation like that, if, 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 if you're right, like if that's true, then the organization probably has, I mean, I'm just, I'm going back to Jeremy's kind of opening remarks yesterday of the amount of turnover and costs that, um, that this type of culture or conflict can create within an organization. You're probably going to have a decent amount of turnover, um, and a dis- decent amount of issues, grievances, however, whatever your organization, however you quantify, um, these issues. And if you create kind of like an inoculation in your, in your unit where, like why why are why is your turnover two percent when our company turnover is twenty five percent? Like now, all of a sudden, you have some like there's a, a a use case to make changes more more broadly, or or at least give you a little bit more legs to stand on for people to hear what you have to say when you're saying, hey, I've been you know I want to share with you what we've been seeing and what we've been trying. Um, I I'm I'm I want to kind of even though I, I know Sarah. Sarah asked a question, and I think she's maybe changing it a little bit in terms of the perspective, but um, it's almost like we're, t- it seems like what we're talking about is if we're, and again, I love that we're carrying this fragrance analogy out uh, to, to, to the nth degree, but if like there's a spectrum of like, okay, it's just pure lavender, like, or, or, or pure, you know, you know what, maybe it's not a good scent, but it's just pure. It's just, that is the scent. Um, it's very homogenous. That's what it is to a spectrum of it's maybe, uh, diverse scents that are kind of going together. And as you move down, there's maybe some compliment, complimenting of the scents where teams are working really well together. There's a really, it's like a optimal level of diversity and, um, and, and, and good vibes in terms of what your, what the scent is to maybe so, so, uh, so many different scents, uh, a sense that it's maybe chaotic, um, or maybe hard to kind of, um, grapple with. And, and that was something that was brought up in a, in a recent s- session of more diversity leads to more productivity, but also more conflict. Um, what are your all thoughts on, we've been kind of focusing on the, the you know, uh, on a couple different ends of these perspe- uh, spectrum, but how might you approach an organization that is saying, okay, it's all lavender. It's, we're all very homogenous. There's no conflict. Um, is there any, how might you, if you're a leader stepping into that type of organization where everything is so, so homogenous and, but also conflict free, is there any value in maybe exploring how do we add complement notes to the, to the culture that's already existing? I'm using a lot of metaphors. I know. I hope that makes sense. I'll, I'll jump, I'll jump in here. So I think, um, there are a couple of assumptions that organizations make and we make sometimes as individuals. The first assumption is that conflict is bad. And so if there is no conflict, that it is something that it is positive. But I would challenge that. I would challenge that. And in fact, Alice, like you, I've done some some work with with families and, and family mediation. And families that concern me the most, the couples that concern me the most, were the couples that came in and said, we never fight. We never fight. And some of the most violent interactions I saw was among couples who use the most polite language to each other. And yet yet the level of violence and the level of contempt was immense. So I think the teams that do not fight, um, my question would be, are they truly as productive? Are they truly as innovative? Are they truly working at kind of their best potential or are they just sort of tagging along? Something else that I want to suggest, you know, I work in academia and in academia, we worship 
at the altar of civility. And I'm trying, trying my best to lead everyone away from that altar. Because sometimes when we focus so much on civility, it becomes a vehicle of oppression. Did, did I lose you guys? Sorry. Your, audio, your audio is fine, screen? Henry. Your, your video is a little frozen, but your audio is fine. Uh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. So, um, so I, I was just saying, you know, sometimes when we focus so much on civility, again, don't rock the boat, let everyone be the same. This becomes a vehicle of, of oppression. This becomes a vehicle of oppression. So I think the question to every team that we work with, the question to the homogeneous team that maybe does not have conflict is, are people really at their highest potential? Are people really, because when people are at their highest potential, there's gonna be tension, there's gonna be conflict. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. And it's not necessarily a bad thing if someone speaks in a way that is passionate. If someone, especially who has been minoritized and who has not been in the table, maybe sometimes comes to the table and they have a lot to say, you know, it's okay. It's okay. It makes everyone better if we bring them in, if we give them space, if we engage with everyone and create space for conflict. Yeah, Henry, what you, uh, as you're talking, I think of the the concept of uh, you stress mm -hmm. and the idea that, you know, you want to stay at that learning edge and to continue to build, you need you need some stress. Um, you don't want to go far into dis distress, but yeah, you, you need you need something pushing against you that resistance so that you can you can be stronger and stronger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the same way, like when you're building, when you're growing, right, you want to work out so that your muscles pull the bone apart. And that's how you grow taller. So if you're not pushing the boundaries of communication, you are not growing as humans, right? Because you're staying within this confine. And so very much, Henry, I agree with you that, you know, no conflict does not mean that it is a healthy place. It just means that you are okay to stay in the cage that someone has put you in and you're not building out a larger framework for yourself. And I also think conflict is a wonderful tool to help people grow in having difficult conversations. Many people are conflict averse because they don't have the skill set to be able to have a difficult conversation easily, right? Mm -hmm. Easily. In my opinion, you can have most conversations easily if you know how. If you don't know how to approach it, it begins to feel like a difficult conversation. So teams that have conflict, if they're able to work through it and get to a resolution, they're going to like excel. And there's studies that show that more diverse teams come up with far more creative solutions for problems that are given to them because they're seeing the problem from many different perspectives, not the same one. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm just being mindful of the time. We're gonna have to cl uh, close here in just a minute. Um, uh, but yeah, it's almost kind of like the like if you're existing in the there is no conflict, it's really easy to get comfortable, and maybe you're not noticing that there's an issue. And that's almost kind of like if there is conflict, at least you know that there's something to address. So I'm, it's actually kind of interesting that there's no urgency to change anything um, that might be uh, causing challenges to your organization that might maybe even blow up at some point because people are just so concerned about accommodating. Um, so let's go ahead. We got about two minutes left before we got to wrap up. So let's just do a quick go around. Um, you, I'm going to invite invite you to use as many hyphens as you want, but I'm going to I'm going to want you to to give everybody kind of a parting word um, to kind of think about from this conversation. What's the thing organically for you that's like when you think about developing course correcting the, the fragrance of, of an organization? What's the one kind of word or, you know, hyphen string of words that you kind of want folks paying attention to this to be thinking about? Change is hard and changing culture is really hard and uh, it can take a long time. Chances are you're not going to change it in a day, a month, probably even a year, but you just have to keep at it. Change is hard. <laughs> That's the thing I keep saying. Change is hard. Perfect. I would say embrace conflict and learn to get to a resolution in a healthy manner. And my parting words would be 
think of what fragrance you give. How do you contribute to the space, right? As a leader, as don't focus so much on the title. Try to lead without the title. You know, even if the leader is not being part of your title, even if you're somewhere in mid-management, even if you're at the very bottom of the organization, you can still contribute to the culture and climate within your own space and be mindful of what you're contributing contributing to that Henry, space. Henry, you're telling us to be Febreze, is what you're telling us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Be the be the fragrance. Um, uh, so um, we're going to have to take a take a wrap and go to a break um, so we can get, uh, move on to our, our next session. So um, uh, Jeremy, do you want to uh, say anything before we before we head off? Yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for for participating in this. Alice, Terrell, Henry, and thanks, Luke, for moderating. This was a great great discussion. So important for people to hear this kind of stuff, um, especially if they're new to the idea of workplace peace building. Um, I will say there was one question of like some tools to help these conversations when people get defensive. Stay tuned for 4.30 p.m. de-escalation skills with Luke. I think you'll find some tools there uh, on that topic. So thank you all. We're going to take a five minute break and we'll be back with the Neurobiology of Conflict by Dr. Melinda Burrell. Thank you, folks. Thank you, everyone. So good to meet you, uh, Alice, and so good to see you, Terrell. Same. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Good to see you all.